I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And this is Celebrity Memoir Book Club. The podcast where we read the books so that you don't have to, even though we do believe that everybody has the right to an equal education. And everyone can read a book if they want to read a book. We're not the only ones who can sit here and tell you what's in a book. But if you say, I don't want to read that book, I just want to know what those gals have to say about it. Hey, baby, we are here for that. We have a monopoly on nothing but our own ideas. And that's not even true. I am so willing to uncork this shit and let it leak into the public if you want it. (laughs) (laughs) I was pointing at my brain. (laughs) Oh, my God. Before we start, I want to tell you guys, we have new merch. So... If you are looking for a special something for that special someone this holiday season, hit our website. It's pretty cute. And Claire, if you were to write a memoir about your week, what would you title last week's chapter? Broke as a joke. Hell yeah. Because she's been robbed. I was was robbed by the interweb. An AI thief stole my likeness. And you'll never believe it. I was going to pay off my credit card bill. And I looked and I said, I spent $8,000 this month. That can't be right. I was so frugal. And I was like, that's so weird. I guess things just add up. I'm like, I know I went out to dinner once or twice, but I can't believe it came out to $8,000. Inflation is so crazy. I really was like, wow, I thought I got a handle on my spending, but I guess that someone's got to cut up my credit card. I can't believe this happened. And then for the first time in my life, yeah, I was like, let me just look. Let me look and see what I've been spending money on, which is not something I've ever done before. I just kind of like trust the gods. Chase isn't lying to me. They'll add it up right. And then do you know what actually had happened? Someone had spent $7,000 at Balenciaga. And I went, that makes sense. I can't believe Balenciaga. They went on like five separate trips to Balenciaga and then one to YSL. I can't believe they didn't text you. I can't believe that either. I guess they think I'm that kind of bitch. I'm like, who do you think I am? Literally Kim Kardashian? Oh, my God. Who else is getting something new from Balenciaga every single day? I guess my thief, my likeness. Yeah, I guess someone who looks like you and acts like you and sounds like you and swipes a credit card that says your name. And so they were like, we can fix it. Like, obviously, I was like, I clearly wasn't in Vegas because look at every other charge that day. It was for the New York City Metro. (laughs) I was like, all of those swipe passes, that was me. The Balenciaga, twas not. And then they're like, that's fine. We'll reimburse you or whatever. And then we're going to send you a new card to your house. And I was like, great. But then I was walking around with no credit card. And then do you know what that reminded me? That actually in September, somebody had done a fake charge on my debit card. Oh my God. (laughs) And that one they did ask me, they were like, did you go to this amusement park in like Georgia? And I was like, no, because that time I actually was in Las Vegas, ironically. I wonder if there's any ties to the Vegas. And I also wonder if it has anything to do with the fact that I was in a cyber hack when I was in Vegas. I would say there's a pretty good chance that all these red strings are really just one coherent braid. Braid. (laughs) (laughs) Anyways, so I did get a new debit card, but I guess I never called them to activate it because I never use a debit card. I put everything on credit for the points. I'm on the points gal now. Like Pavit. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But I also don't have cash because who uses cash? And the amount of times I've been walking around and been like, oh, I have no money on me. And then today, I ordered us a CNBC credit card last week and it came, but I haven't activated that either. This is why I'm broke as a joke, because I actually have like 19 cards in my wallet and not a one of them works. You will be really annoyed at yourself when you realize that you just have to like open the app and press activate. I'm not going to do it. Okay. And Ashley, if you were a celebrity and last week was a memoir, what would your chapter be called? Oh my gosh. It would be called, how cute is my dog? Shut up. (laughs) No, boo, tomato, tomato. Yeah, I'm just having a real just cute fest. I just love her so much. I feel like I'm in a bit of a a bit of a warped space right now. And Bug has been like just so fucking gorgeous. And we did a photo shoot last week. My college roommate is a photographer and she like is always asking me if I want headshots. And I'm always like, no, because I hate having my photo taken. But then I was like, actually, let me get a Christmas card done with my dog. <laughs> Do you feel like you have that thing where looking at the beauty of your daughter, it shows you the beauty of yourself? No. You see your features in her? No, I look at her and I go, oh, the next generation is just better. God got it right this time. Yeah. That's just been kind of my week. I just want to say up top, I don't know if you've heard, but recently, unfortunately, Timbaland has been removed from the men that seem not that bad list. He has come out calling Britney Spears crazy. It's just not a nice thing to do given current events. I get that you're friends with JT, but you don't have to verbalize it right now. It really seems like he's trying to discredit her and her story. 
However, good news. We have read a man that we both like so much that Ashley, tell them what you just told me. Oh my God, you guys. I just Googled his height just to see. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) He lives in New York. I've seen him on Raya. I know he was in Raya back in the day. I don't think it's crazy. We have mutual friends with him. I'm just saying. First Minka, next you. Oh my God. I also think he's child free per Minka's memoir. All right. Good to know. Trev, if you hear this, I would love to be a guest on your new podcast. Anyway, this is actually a really genuinely very good book. I don't think we're spoiling it by doing the episode. I think that if you haven't read it, I would recommend you go read it. Okay, you guys, before we start this episode, I just wanted to say there is a word used very prominently throughout this book that has a very different meaning in South Africa versus the United States. It has a very different history in South Africa versus its history in the United States. And we tried to limit the use as much as possible while still giving credence to its purpose in this story. And I just want to be very clear that we do not under any circumstances outside of telling this story think it is okay to use. But after consulting some people that we know and trust, we felt that it was very important to the story of South Africa, to the story being told in this memoir. And we are more than happy to receive any feedback about this episode. So it starts off with the Immorality Act of 1927. In South Africa, there was a law that any European male could not have sex with any woman native to South Africa and vice versa. The penalty would be jail time. So to be born mixed race was quite literally to be born a crime. Yes. So the way this book is written, it goes back and forth between two chapter types. There are more historical grounding chapters that sometimes have personal stories, but are more grounded in like the culture of South Africa at the time. This book really very much was written for American audiences, which is great for me as an American person. Yeah. And because of that, he, as Ashley said, grounds the beginning of each chapter into something you need to understand about South Africa and its history and its people in order to then appreciate the nuance and context of the story he's about to tell you. Yes. And then we get the chapter about where his life was at the time. He starts off with an overview of apartheid and South Africa's history of apartheid, how deep-seated it was, how planned the system was. The genius of apartheid was convincing people who were the overwhelming majority to turn on each other. You separate people into groups and make them hate one another so you can run them all. So basically, in South Africa, there was a ton of different tribes. You've got Zulu. He's from the Kosa tribe, Swana, Sotho, Venda. There's a ton. I think right now he says that South Africa has like 11 official languages. So there is a lot of different groups of people. But it seems like the Zulu and the Kosa, which he is a part of, are two of the more dominant ones. So they all had problems with each other to begin with. So all non-whites were systematically classified into various groups and subgroups. And then these groups were given differing levels of rights and privileges in order to keep them at odds. Perhaps the starkest of these divisions was between South Africa's two dominant groups, the Zulu and the Kosa. The Zulu man is known to be a warrior. He is proud. The Kosa, on the other hand, were considered the thinkers. My mother is Kosa. Nelson Mandela is Kosa. The Zulu went to war with the white man. The Kosa played chess with him. For a long time, neither was particularly successful, and each blamed the other for a problem neither had created. Bitterness festered. For decades, those feelings were held in check by a common enemy. Then apartheid fell. Mandela walked free, and Black South Africa went to war with itself. So he starts this book, chapter one, Run. And he says, sometimes in Hollywood, they have these movies where like they're zipping down a highway, and they jump out of a moving car, and they're rolling down, and they just get up and brush it off like nothing happened. And he goes, I have to tell you, as someone who's been pushed out of a moving car, that's not true. It really fucking hurt. So then he proceeds to tell this story about the time his mother pushed him out of a car. And I will say the way this story is written, it does such a beautiful job of establishing his relationship with his mother, establishing what their life was like, and establishing the way Black South Africa ran under apartheid. And right after, not only does it explain all of these things perfectly, it also like keeps you guessing and doesn't feel so expository. Do you no, know I, mean? I mean, it's a great story that does such a good job of explaining so many different levels. And then they hit you with a pretty shocking twist that makes you want to keep reading. So he talks first that his family is very religious. His mother is so religious. My childhood involved church or some form of church at least four nights a week. And then on Sunday, they went to three different churches. They went to a mixed church, a white church, and then a black church. And that was The day. His mom loved Jesus. And he does also mention like the way that Jesus was introduced to South Africa. And it obviously was not originally a Christian place. And his mom really took to it, loves Jesus, is always praying. They have a lot of arguments about like 
what Jesus wants for them. And it is always what his mom says. She is a stubborn woman who gets her way. And her way is you go to church all day Sunday. So he talks about one particular day that the worst thing that could happen on a Sunday is their car breaks down. And he was always like, well, if we don't have a car, how are we going to get there? And she's like, nope, we're taking the minibuses. And the minibus situation in South Africa is not my precious bus system of New York City, which I'll admit has its problems. I will say it's not that different from your precious bus system of New York City. Don't say that about the MTA. They're trying their best. They get no money. Okay, so the minibus system. So black people were not allowed on buses. And so they established their own unofficial bus system with these unofficial routes driven by literal criminals. It was like gang wars over the bus routes. You couldn't take another gang's bus route. They had a monopoly on the market. They were privatizing it. And then also they would like run whenever they felt like it. So you could wait for an hour for a bus that was supposed to be here yesterday. And then if they saw you get in somebody else's bus, it would kill you. Yeah. (laughs) But so he's like talking about how he hates having to take the bus when their car breaks down because she was very frugal and always getting secondhand cars. To this day, I hate secondhand cars. Almost everything that's ever gone wrong in my life, I can trace back to a secondhand car. Secondhand cars made me get detention for being late to school. Secondhand cars left us hitchhiking on the side of the freeway. A secondhand car was also the reason my mom got married. If it hadn't been for the Volkswagen that didn't work, we would have never looked for the mechanic who became the husband, who became the stepfather, who became the man who tortured us for years and put a bullet in the back of my mother's head. I'll take the new car with the warranty every time. What? Yeah. You don't get answers on that till the last fucking chapter. That's just nestled in there. Can you believe? Crazy. So then he establishes both him and his mom's relationship and the fact that they were both kind of awesome. He says him and his mom were just like the fastest people in town. He and his mom ran so fast, but his mom could always beat him until he got a little bit older. And then he introduces his mom's wit. She was also extremely smart. She was beautiful. You know, Claire and I respect fast running. She says we had a very Tom and Jerry relationship, me and my mom. She was the strict disciplinarian. I was naughty as shit. She would send me out to buy groceries and I wouldn't come home right away because I'd be using the change from the milk and bread to play arcade games at the supermarket. I will say he is naughty. He is naughty. At first I'm like, oh, you were just like an ADD kid. But then he starts telling some of the trouble he got into. And I was like, oh, you are like capital N naughty. (laughs) She would go at a full sprint in high heels. But if she really wanted to come after me, she'd do this thing where she'd kick her shoes off while she was still going top speed. She'd do this weird move with her ankles and the heels would go flying off and she wouldn't even miss a step. That's when I knew, okay, she's in turbo mode now. When I was little, she always caught me. But as I got older, I got faster. And when speed failed her, she'd use her wits. If I was about to get away, she'd yell, stop, thief. She would do this to her own child. In South Africa, nobody gets involved in other people's business unless it's mob justice and everyone wants in. So she'd yell, thief, knowing it would bring the whole neighborhood out against me and I'd have strangers trying to grab me and tackle me. That is hilarious. Okay, so they are close. They are smart. They are fast. They go to a lot of church and they take illegal mob buses when the car doesn't work. And she wasn't afraid of anything, his mother. We'll get into more of the incredibly like brave things she did and the way that she just lived whatever life she wanted, regardless of the law, regardless of what was safe. And he says they would be waiting out in these all-weight neighborhoods where it was quite literally illegal for them to be waiting for these mob run buses in the middle of the night where they weren't coming. And he would be like, shouldn't we get out of here? Aren't we worried? And she'd tell me not to worry. She always came back to the phrase she lived by, if God is with me, who can be against me? She was never scared, even when she should have been. So one of these Sundays, the car's broken down. They're waiting around for a bus. It never comes. They're waiting for an hour. And finally, she says, you know what? We're just going to have to hitchhike. So she waves down a car. The guy picks her up. They get in. And the minute they get in, a bus driver, a furious Zulu bus driver shows up and is like, what the fuck are you guys doing? You're stealing my customers. I'm about to kill you. He pulls out a gun to kill the guy in the front. And they're like, no, 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 no. We'll get in your bus. We just didn't think you were coming. We'll get in your bus. So they get in the bus and they find out that she's Kosa. They, of course, have big beefs between the two of them. The stereotypes of Zulu and Kosa women were as ingrained as those of the men. Zulu women were well-behaved and dutiful. Kosa women were promiscuous and unfaithful. And here was my mother, his tribal enemy, a Kosa woman alone with two small children. One of them was mixed, no less. Not just a whore, but a whore who sleeps with a white man. Oh, you're Kosa, he said. That explains it. Disgusting women. So the bus driver is antagonizing Trevor's mother. And his younger brother is in the mom's arms. Trevor is falling asleep because they've been bussing around to various churches literally all day. And now it is like nine o'clock at night. And he starts antagonizing her. She realizes they're in a dangerous situation. And so she asks to get out. She's like, we'll just walk from here. And the bus driver's like, absolutely not. So she leans over to Trevor and whispers when we slow down at the next stop sign, because also this guy was blowing through traffic signs. So she was like, but he'll at least slow to look and we'll roll out of the car. Trevor is asleep. So he does not hear her say, I'm going to push you out of the car. And so they slow down at a stop sign. She flings the door open, pushes him out. 
tucks and rolls, holding the baby close to her, and then yells for him to sprint. And they just sprint and sprint and sprint until they get to a mini store. And he's like, what the fuck was that? (laughs) Because he also, he was like, well, when she said run, like, sure, I was asleep and then I was being pushed out of a car, but I knew what run means. So I was running. And he goes, had I had a different life, getting thrown out of a speeding minibus might have phased me. I'd have stood there like an idiot going, what's happening, mom? Why are my legs so sore? But there was none of that. Mom said run and I ran. So then they get home. They got to the mini store. They called the cops. The cops ended up driving them home. And they have another argument about whether or not they were supposed to leave that day. And he says, the devil tricked you into going out. And that's why we were in danger. And she says, no, Trevor, that's not how the devil works. This is part of God's plan. He wanted to test us. (laughs) She just will talk circles around him. So then he talks about how apartheid was a police state, a system of surveillance and laws designed to keep black people under total control. A full compendium of those laws would run more than 3,000 pages and weigh approximately 10 pounds. But the general thrust of it should be easy enough for any American to understand. In America, you have the forced removal of natives onto reservations coupled with slavery followed by segregation. Imagine all three of those things happening to the same group of people at the same time. That was apartheid. So he gets into the laws that he was born under, where it was illegal for a white person and a black person to be together sexually or kind of at all. And his mom just kind of didn't care. So his father is a Swiss German man named Robert. And basically, there's like white, there's black. He is mixed, which then gets classified under a different group of people called colored people, which often refers to like a whole other sect of people. And so basically, he would be allowed to be with them, but he is not allowed to be seen with black people or with white people. He is a completely different third group. Right. And that third group is legal when two people who are considered colored people have a baby so that there are like mixed lines and there's like a section of mixed people. Under apartheid, if you were a black man, you worked on a farm or in a factory or in a mine. If you were a black woman, you worked in a factory or as a maid. Those were pretty much your only options. My mother didn't want to work in a factory and she was a horrible cook and never would have stood for some white lady yelling at her. So true to her nature, she found an option that was not among the ones presented to her. She took a secretarial course, a typing class. By law, white colored jobs and skilled labor jobs were reserved for whites. Black people didn't work in offices. My mom, however, was a rebel. And fortunately for her, her rebellion came around at the right moment. So there were also people who lived in these secret flats because not everyone actually cared about these laws. A good number of people acknowledged them as completely absurd, especially the white people who moved to South Africa for jobs like this Swiss German man and all these other people from Switzerland, Germany, Denmark. There were a lot of people who were like, we're not really going to uphold these rules. We don't care. They would rent out apartments for prostitutes who would use those spaces And so she meets a bunch of prostitutes who show her how to get an illegal apartment. And so she ends up living on a floor with the Swiss German man that she eventually has a baby with. It was so dangerous for her to be there. So what they did was they had these things called homelands, which were semi-sovereign black territories that were in reality puppet states of the government in Pretoria. But this so-called white country could not function without black labor to produce its wealth, which meant that black people had to be allowed to live near white areas and townships. The government planned ghettos built to house black workers, like Soweto, which is where he lived. The township was where you lived, but your status as a laborer was the only thing that permitted you to stay there. If your papers were revoked for any reason, you could be deported back to the homelands. To leave the township for work in the city or for any other reason, you had to carry a pass with your ID number. Otherwise, you could be arrested. There was also a curfew. But his mother didn't care, so she just found his apartment in the white neighborhood. And she did it by befriending all the prostitutes. Mm -hmm. Those were often the only black women allowed in the neighborhoods because like men would give them a little place. Yeah. I mean, well, they weren't allowed. So they had this system in place. Maids were allowed in the neighborhood. So the prostitutes would often wear maid uniforms and then they would get these apartments rented to them illegally by white men who, you know, wanted them nearby. So her mom operated under the same kind of like system as these prostitutes where she would like wear maids uniforms when she was walking to and from her apartment. And she used the same system to get an apartment. She just wasn't a prostitute. So she's living in this apartment. I think as Ashley said, this man, Robert, was up the hall. They started chatting. He was 20 years older than her. And for some reason, she's just like, I want to have a baby with you. And he's like, I don't want a kid. And she's like, oh, you don't have to raise it. I just want your sperm. And he's like, no, that's crazy. (laughs) But she just keeps asking. And one day he finally is like, fine, go for it. Nine months after that, on February 20th, 1984, my mother checked into Hillborough Hospital for a scheduled C-section delivery. Estranged from her family, pregnant by a man she could not be seen with in public, she was alone. My father isn't on my birth certificate. Officially, he's never been my father, and my mother, true to her word, was prepared for him not to be involved. Where most children are proof of their parents' love, I was proof of their criminality. The only time I could be with my father was indoors. If we left the house, he'd have to walk across the street from us. 
So he actually can't be seen with either his mother or his father because the evidence of his mixed race existence is proof that they broke the law. Yeah, he's so much lighter than his mom. It was very clear when they were next to each other. So he couldn't hold his mom's hand in public. He couldn't call either of his parents, really mom or dad, publicly. When his cousins would be playing out in the yard at his grandma's house, they would keep him so close indoors because he says the other effect of having an apartheid state and like living in this police state where everything is illegal is like a lot of people were narcs and you never know who was a narc. So if you're playing outside with your cousins and they say, well, who's that boy? Why does he exist? He would have just gotten taken and put into it like an orphanage. Mm -hmm. So he spent a lot of his childhood alone at home. The only places he ever went were to his grandmother's house where they again lived in the townships, but you couldn't be white there. So if they had seen him again, they would have been like, what's that white person doing here? And if the cops had been called, he would have been arrested and thrown into the orphanage. So he was always just inside. He said in Soweto, the police were an occupying army. They didn't wear collared shirts. They wore riot gear. They were militarized. They operated in teams known as flying squads because they would swoop in out of nowhere, riding in on armored personnel carriers with slotted holes in the side of the vehicle to fire their guns out of. You didn't mess with a hippo. If you saw one, you ran. That was a fact of life. The township was in a constant state of insurrection. Someone was always marching or protesting somewhere and had to be suppressed. Playing in my grandmother's house, I'd hear gunshots, screams, tear gases being fired into the crowds. He talks about growing up and how it was so unfair because his cousins were allowed to play outside and he never was. And his grandparents would be like, well, if you go outside, you'll be taken. And he thought they meant by the other children. He didn't understand what the problem was. And now he's like, oh, they mean like by the police. I would be kidnapped forever. Yeah. And he, for most of his life, didn't know anyone else who was like him. So he had no context for it. He just thought he was different. Yeah, it's interesting because he's being raised in a black community. His mother is black. His white dad, he barely sees. So like to him, he's black, but he's not a part of the black group. And because of apartheid, he can't really be there legally. And so he never meets other mixed kids. At first, I didn't like understand how that could be possible. But then he talks about yeah, once Mandela was elected and we could finally live freely, exiles started to return. So he meets other mixed kids. And when he's around 17, he told me his story. And I was like, wait, you mean we could have left? There was an option. Imagine being thrown out of an airplane. You hit the ground and break all your bones and you go to the hospital to heal and you move on and you fully put the whole thing behind you. And then one day someone tells you about parachutes. That's how I felt. I couldn't understand why we stayed. I went straight home and asked my mom, why didn't we just leave? Why didn't we go to Switzerland? Because I am not Swiss, she said, as stubborn as ever. This is my country. Why should I leave? So he grew up in a mostly matriarchal family. His mother had actually left her own family around 20 years old and just cut off all ties with them and then had Trevor and came back and raised her son with them. And in the house was his mother, obviously, his grandmother, and then his great-grandmother, Coco, who was blind and just sat near the fire all day. <laughs> yeah. The fact that I grew up in a world run by women was no accident. Apartheid kept me away from my father because he was white, but for almost all the kids I knew on my grandmother's block in Soweto, apartheid had taken their fathers away as well, just for different reasons. The fathers were off working the mine somewhere, able to come home only on the holidays. Their fathers had been sent to prison. Their fathers were in exile, fighting for the cause. Women held the community together. He talks about the way Soweto built up over time. Everyone was given some space in this area. And at first they would all start out, which is like a makeshift plywood cabin sort of. And then just slowly over time, you would build a wall. And then maybe a few years later, you get some money, you build a second wall. And over years and generations, homes were built up in this area. And everything was kind of makeshift. Like they couldn't have businesses there because it was a black neighborhood. So everything was just like out of people's garages and they had like a whole economy. It just was not official. There's something magical about Soweto. Yes, it was a prison designed by our oppressors, but it also gave us a sense of self-determination and control. Soweto was ours. It had an aspirational quality that you don't find elsewhere. In America, the dream is to make it out of the ghetto. In Soweto, because there was no leaving the ghetto, the dream was to transform the ghetto. So again, his mom is, I think, a genius. Like, just a very intelligent, smart, and resourceful woman. Trevor talks a lot about how you can only dream as big as you know what exists. And the incredible thing about his mother is that she always made sure that he knew what else was out there. But he's like, but who told her? How did she know to escape to these other places? How did she know that even though she didn't have anything, to make sure that I could see what was beyond? And I mean, this book is a real testament to her. So she spoke a number of languages. Like we said... South Africa, I think now has 11 official languages. And at the time, a lot of people spoke a lot of different languages. And 
She knew so many of them and spoke them perfectly and made sure that he knew. So when he was like 10 years old, he was fluent in like five or six different languages and understood the accents, understood when they were used. And so because he didn't really fit in anywhere, he realized that language was this great connector. Language, even more than color, defines who you are as people. I became a chameleon. My color didn't change, but I could change your perception of my color. If you spoke to me in Zulu, I replied to you in Zulu. And so he would just like learn how to respond to what he was being given to get out of a lot of sticky situations. Because like he had to move through the world very carefully. He was illegal. So he speaks English, which his mom makes sure she learns first. English is the language of money. English comprehension is equated with intelligence. If you're looking for a job, English is the difference between getting the job or staying unemployed. After English, COSA is what we spoke around the house. She learned Zulu because it's similar to COSA. She spoke German because of my father. She spoke Afrikaans because it's useful to know the language of your oppressor. And Sotho she learned in the streets. Sotho is another tribe. Living with my mom, I saw how she used language to cross boundaries, handle situations, navigate the world. We were in a shop one time. The shopkeeper right in front of us turned to a security guard and said in Afrikaans, follow those blacks in case they steal something. My mother turned around and said in beautiful, fluent Afrikaans, why don't you follow these blacks so you can help them find what they're looking for? Ah, jammer, he said, apologizing in Afrikaans. Then, and this is the funny thing, he didn't apologize for being racist. He merely apologized for aiming his racism at us. Oh, I'm so sorry, he said. I thought you were like the other blacks. You know how they love to steal. Tell me how by the age of 10, he was speaking like five languages. And after 15 years of French, I'm speaking no French. I've been taking Danish on Babbel for a week now, and I, I could probably... Do you know how to say hello? Yeah, it's just hi. Okay. Well, one down. Listen, a win is a win. You know how you say bye? Let me hear it. Hi, hi. <laughs> That's stupid. <laughs> Oh, I cannot wait for my move to Copenhagen. If you're not on the Patreon, you don't even know what I'm talking about. Also, we're recording this episode a few weeks in advance. So maybe by the time it comes out, I'll be fluent. Oh my God. Yeah. Call her and ask. Ask me how it's going. Uh, call her up and say hi. Ask me how my Danish is going. How's your Danish going? Fantastisk. <laughs> As apartheid was coming to an end, South Africa's elite private school started accepting children of all colors. My mother's company offered bursaries, scholarships for underprivileged families, and she managed to get me into Maryvale College, an expensive private Catholic school. So he goes, he said it was like this amazing post-race Catholic school where there was kids of every color and every socioeconomic background, and there was no division. Every clique was racially mixed. Everybody wore the same outfit and got along. But he was pretty naughty, so he got kicked out real quick. <laughs> yeah, and then he went to another school where there was like a pretty distinct black group and white group. He always identified as black. The white kids would talk to him, but he'd be like, this just doesn't resonate with my experience because he was raised in black communities. So he gets put in like the A classes, which is like the white classes. He was like, I want to be in the class with my friends. And they were like, no. You do realize the effect this will have on your future. You do understand that what you're giving up. This will impact the opportunities you'll have for the rest of your life. Um, he's doing like pretty well. Yeah. I think that it was like a good call because it seems like it didn't hold him back. I moved to B classes with the black kids. I decided I'd rather be held back with people I liked than move ahead with people I didn't know. So he talks about one of the main features of apartheid was blocking knowledge and education. So there were some mission schools where Catholics would come in and try to give like a good education. But then there was these things called Bantu schools, which taught no science, no history, no civics. They taught metrics and agriculture, how to count potatoes, how to pave roads, chop wood, till the soil. It does not serve the Bantu to learn history and science because he is primitive, the government said. This will only mislead him, showing him pastures in which he is not allowed to graze. My mother was blessed that her village was one of the places where a mission school had contrived to stay open in spite of the government's Bantu education policies. There she had a white pastor who taught her English. She didn't have food or shoes or even a pair of underwear, but she had English. She could read and write, and when she was old enough, she stopped working on the farm and got a job in a factory in a nearby town. My mother used to tell me I chose to have you because I wanted something to love and something that would love me unconditionally in return. My grandparents' marriage was an unhappy one. They met and married in Sophia Town, but one year later, the army came in and drove them out. The government seized their homes and bulldozed the whole area to build a fancy new white suburb called Triumph. Along with tens of thousands of other black people, my grandparents were forcibly relocated to Soweto, to a neighborhood called the Meadowlands. They divorced not long after that. My grandfather moved to Orlando with my mom, my aunt, and my uncle. So the reason that his mom was raised on a farm was that her mother, in classic children fashion, blamed her mother who raised her as opposed to her father who abandoned her. When she was like 12, 13, she said to her mom, I don't want to live with you anymore. I want to live with dad because I like him better than you. And the mother said, fine, go live with him if you like him better. She went to live with him. And he said, well, you're of no value to me. You're too much money. So he sent her to go work a farm with his aunt, where she was essentially a farmhand. 
and they had barely enough to eat and she like had nothing. My mother didn't see her family again for 12 years. She lived in a hut with 14 cousins. I mean, she just had this ambition and this drive. So many black families spend all their time trying to fix the problems of the past. It's the curse of being black and poor and it's a curse that follows you from generation to generation. My mom calls it the black tax because the generations who came before you have been pillaged rather than being free to use your skills and education to move forward. You lose everything just trying to bring everyone behind you back up to zero. So after working for 12 years on this farm and where she sometimes had to eat the food that she was stealing from the animals, she finally said, I can't take this anymore. I want to go make money and at least have it be my own. So she goes and gets a job in a factory where she's paid with a plate of food every night. And she's like, I'll take it. It's better than nothing. At least I've earned it. And then after doing that for three years, my mom wrote to my grand asking her to send the price of a train ticket, about 30 rand, to bring her home. Back in Soweto, my mom enrolled in one of the secretarial courses that allowed her to grab hold of the bottom rung of the white collar world. She worked and worked and worked for a living, but living under my grandmother's roof, she wasn't allowed to keep her own wages. As a secretary, my mom was bringing home more money than anyone else. My grandmother insisted it all go to the family. The family needed a radio, an oven, a refrigerator, and now it was my mom's job to provide it. So eventually, one day, she just runs away, gets on a train, shows up in Johannesburg, and never looks back. And that's where the prostitutes teach her how to get an apartment and use the maid's clothes to move around white areas. And that's where she meets the Swiss German man who becomes Trevor Noah's father. When she had Trevor, the most important thing was that he learned to read. My mother wanted her child beholden to no fate. She wanted me to be free to go anywhere, do anything, be anyone. She gave me the tools to do it as well. She taught me English as my first language. She read to me constantly. The first book I learned to read was the book, the Bible. My books were my prized possession. I had a bookshelf where I put them and I was so proud of it. I loved my books and kept them in pristine condition. They were very poor, but they did what they could. And she was always trying to give him experiences. People thought my mom was crazy. Ice rinks and drive-ins and suburbs, these places were the things of white people. So many black people had internalized the logic of apartheid and made it their own. Why teach a black child white things? Neighbors and relatives used to pester my mom. Why do all this? Why show him the world when he's going to live in the ghetto? Because, she would say, even if he never leaves the ghetto, he will know that the ghetto is not the world. If that is all that I can accomplish, I've done enough. We tell people to follow their dreams, but you can only dream of what you can imagine. And depending on where you're from, your imagination can be quite limited. So then he talks about the way that apartheid fell because it makes no sense. One of the examples he gives is that Chinese people in South Africa were characterized as black, but Japanese people were categorized as white because South Africa wanted to have a good relationship with Japan because of the electronics that they were producing. And so he was like, you know, it's crazy. A police officer could go up to an Asian person on a bench and be like, hey, get off that bench. That's for white people. And then be like, well, I'm Japanese. He's like, oh, I apologize, sir. I didn't mean to be racist. Have a good afternoon. And he's like, it just doesn't make any sense. My mother used to tell me, I chose to have you because I wanted something to love and something that would love me unconditionally in return. And then I gave birth to the most selfish piece of shit on earth and all it ever did was cry and eat and shit and say me, 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 me. If you weren't engaging to me, I was trouble. I wasn't a shit to people. I wasn't whiny and spoiled. I had good manners. I was just high energy and I knew what I wanted to do. So he was naughty and him and his mom were going at it nonstop. It was very much a them against the world thing, but they were also them against each other. But they were both like smart and bantery and she was ruled by logic that made sense to her. So he says sometimes he would come home in trouble from school. But if she agreed that the thing he got in trouble for was stupid, she wouldn't punish him. But then other times she was a big uh, hider, which means whipping with a stick. My mom was forever trying to rein me in. Over the years, her tactics grew more and more sophisticated. When I had youth and energy on my side, she had cunning and she figured out different ways to keep me in line. At one point, he said he was a better arguer than she was because he was so swift and like so good at finding loopholes that she made a new rule in the house that you could only fight via letter. <laughs> so they would write letters back and forth. And whenever he would come to fight her, he'd be like, uh-uh, put it in the letter. And he's like, sometimes we would go four or five days without speaking, only writing a letter. Dear Trevor, children, obey your parents and everything for this pleases the Lord. Colossians 3.20. There are certain things I expect from you as my child and as a young man. You need to clean your room. You need to keep the house. You need to look after your school uniform. Please, my child, I ask you, respect my rules so that I may also respect you. I ask you now, please go and do the dishes and do the weeds in the garden. Yours sincerely, mom. To whom it may concern, dear mom. <laughs> I have received your correspondence earlier. I am delighted to say that I am ahead of schedule on the dishes and will continue to wash them in an hour or so. Please note that the garden is wet, so I cannot do the weeds at this time, but please be assured that this task will be completed by the end of the weekend. Also, I completely agree with what you are saying with regard to my respect levels, and I will maintain my room to satisfactory standard. Yours sincerely, Trevor. I love this response. She had one where she was mad that his grades had slipped, and he said, to whom it may concern, 
First of all, this has been a particularly tough time in school. And for you to say that my marks are bad is extremely unfair, especially considering the fact that you yourself were not very good in school. And I am, after all, a product of yours. And so in part, you are to blame because if you are not good in school, why would I be good in school? Because genetically, we are the same. Grant always talks about how naughty you are. So obviously, my naughtiness comes from you. And I don't think it's right or fair or just for you to say any of this. You're sincerely Trevor. <laughs> Can you imagine? I was creative and independent and full of energy. The therapist did give me a series of tests and they came to the conclusion that I was either going to make an excellent criminal or be very good at catching criminals. He was just always getting into trouble in this Catholic school and they sent him to a therapist three times because they thought he was so fucked up. And the therapist was like, I don't know, man, you make some good points. One of the things he got in trouble for was because he wasn't Catholic. He wasn't allowed to have the Eucharist, but he always wanted grape juice and crackers and he was pissed he couldn't have it. So one day he went in and he'd always be like, but Jesus isn't even Catholic. He's Jewish. So if you're saying that Jesus himself showed up, he couldn't eat his own body. And they're like, listen, we don't know. <laughs> and so one day he went back there and he drank the whole jug of juice and ate an entire sleeve of crackers. And he got in so much trouble. And his mom was like, what are you mad about? He wants more Jesus in him and you won't give it to him? The boy can't have a little Jesus? <laughs> that doesn't even make sense. Why wouldn't you want the child to have some Jesus in his life? <laughs> so she's like, no, you're not in trouble. Yeah, he did actually do really fucked up things sometimes, though. He was, like, obsessed with fire and knives. He's like, my two big things, my two big loves in this world were fire and knives. And at one point, he, like, burnt a white family's house fully to the ground. But, like, not even as an act of rebellion. He was visiting his friend who lived in a house in their backyard with his mother, who was their maid. And he was obsessed with burning things into... Okay, he says he was obsessed with burning his own initials into wood. But I'm like, I've never heard of that. I've heard people burning ants with the sun. I wonder if he softens it for his own self. I mean, that does sound cool. I don't know. I'd like to try burning my initials into wood. I'm intrigued. But he like left the magnifying glass and matches on a straw bed. And then they like got locked out and then they forgot about it. And they were like, well, if we're locked out anyway, we might as well just keep hanging. And then the whole thing went up in flames. Yeah. But there was no punishment for me that day. My mom was too much in shock. There's naughty and then there's burning down a white person's house. She didn't know what to do. <laughs> and he says he got in trouble all the time and he was always getting whipped and always getting punished. But I was blessed with another trait I inherited from my mother, her ability to forget the pain in life. I remember the thing that caused the trauma, but I don't hold on to the trauma. I never let the memory of something painful prevent me from trying something new. If you think too much about the ass kicking your mom gave you or the ass kicking that life gave you, you'll stop pushing the boundaries and breaking the rules. It's better to take it, spend some time crying, then wake up the next day and move on. You'll have a few bruises and they'll remind you of what happened, but that's okay. But after a while, the bruises fade and they fade for a reason because now it's time to get up and get to some shit again. Mm, I have to say, I really liked this book. He does a really good job of using his life to like teach you a lot and it's compelling and it's interesting. I don't know how honest of a reflection he has on himself. No. He has a real, I'm healed. Nothing bothers me. M my dad, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> we had a really great talk one time about how he did love me all those years and now I feel full. And you're like, totally. I heard that's how it works. Like for him to sit here and be like, drama rolled off my back just like I rolled out of that car that one time that man tried to kill me for being a different tribe than he was. And I'm like, I'm sure. <laughs> Okay, so this chapter we can just breeze through. He had a dog named Foofy. He had no idea Foofy was deaf, which, you know, you'd think you'd figure out. But they figured out when he died and the vet was like, was it weird having a deaf dog? And they were like, we thought Foofy was stupid. <laughs> Actually, they had two dogs. It was Foofy and Panther. And they would call him in for dinner and Panther would come and then go back and get Foofy and come. And they were like, oh my God, their whole lives, Panther was telling Foofy what the directions were. How cute. And that did make me like cry. But so now he has this crazy thing where every time they came home, Foofy would be in front of the gate to their house. Their gate is like five feet tall. So they're like, how is Foofy getting out? So Foofy would scale the gate and leave the house. And then it turns out that he was going or she, I don't know, Foofy was going to another house all day. And this other family thought Foofy was their dog and like leaving at night. And so Foofy just like fully had two families and they went to go get Foofy because now this other family is like locking Foofy in now that they know that Foofy's been cheating on them. And they were like, well, this is literally our dog. Like, you can't have it. And the other family was like, no, this is literally our dog. And so Trevor goes back with his mom and the mom brings all the vet records and is like, this is literally our dog. And Trevor is like wailing and sobbing and crying. And they go to try and get her and they end up having to pay this other family. And Foofy like kind of doesn't really want to come home or like doesn't really give a shit. Well, Foofy can't hear. I mean, remember at this point, they don't know that Foofy's deaf. Yeah. So he's yelling, you're my dog. And the other parent is like, no, they're my dog. Meanwhile, Foofy's just looking, thinking that all of his friends got together for a party. Yeah. So Trevor's like on the way home, just like sobbing. And his mom's like, I got you the dog back. What's up? And he's like, Foofy loves another boy. <laughs> Foofy was my first heartbreak. No one has ever betrayed me more than Foofy. It was a valuable lesson to me. The hard thing was understanding that Foofy wasn't cheating on me with another boy. She was merely living her life to the fullest. Until I knew that she wasn't going out on her own during the day, her relationship hadn't affected me at all. Foofy had no malicious intent. 
I believe that Fufi was my dog, but of course that wasn't true. Fufi was a dog. I was a boy. We got along well. She happened to live in my house. That experience shaped what I felt about relationships for the rest of my life. You do not own the thing you love. Ugh, Trevor? Trevor? Yeesh. I don't know that this was the conclusion. I will say this conclusion bummed me the fuck out. I was like, I swear to fucking God, if Bug ever like loved someone else, I would lay in front of a train. Okay, I don't know that that's the better conclusion. I'm saying whatever your conclusion is about your dog probably shouldn't impact your romantic relationship. <laughs> Didn't even occur to me. <laughs> I was lucky to learn that lesson at a young age. I have so many friends who still, as adults, wrestle with feelings of betrayal. I mean, yeah, that's like one of the big human experiences. You can be betrayed as an adult and as a child. They'll come to me angry and crying and talk about how they've been cheated on and lied to. And I feel for them. I understand what they're going through. I sit with them, buy them a drink, and I say, friend, let me tell you the story of Foofy. Trevor, I've heard the old I can't love you, a girl broke my heart when I was 16 excuse, but I've never heard the I can't love you once my dog knew someone else. Well, it's not even I can't love you. It's like you can't ask people not to cheat on you the same way you can't ask a deaf dog to not know where it's at all the time. (laughs) I mean, this idea that like we don't owe anything to one another, that all we are are like ships in the night. This is what he learned from his dad. Yeah. This is the trauma of the relationship with his dad. And he's like projected it onto his dog. And is acting like he learned some elevated lesson of like, cheating can't hurt you if you never trust. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) We'll get to the dad part later. But he's like, oh, me and my dad just didn't talk for 10 years. But that doesn't mean he didn't love me. And it's totally cool. And now I feel fulfilled. And you're like, okay, I don't believe you. I don't believe you that it's all good now. Because I've known a lot of dads that have been a lot more present and people are a lot more fucked up. So... And so then we get into his dad. He talks about how his dad was never interested in marriage. He used to say that most people marry because they want to control another person, and he never wanted to be controlled. Okay. I mean, I guess that really loops around with the Foofy story pretty smoothly. So when he was 24, his mom was like, why don't you meet your dad again? And he's like, at this point, I had not seen my dad in 10 years. Growing up, he had seen him every Sunday. And then he became a teenager, and he was like, actually, I'd rather play video games. And then... His mom got remarried and he got a stepdad and the stepdad didn't love that they still were in the life of a former lover. And so they just drifted apart and then the dad moved to Cape Town and they just never saw each other again. And he was like, why would I need to know my dad? And she was like, I don't know. I just think you might want to. They find him and it's tough because his dad is very secretive. His dad is like a real private Swiss person. I guess that's like a Swiss thing, huh? Yeah. Like he's like a bank account. Totally. Offshore. Not your bank account. No, my bank account is for anybody who wants it. (laughs) If you're in Vegas, use my money. (laughs) Okay, so he finds his dad and he sends a letter and his dad's like, of course I want to see you. And I will say he never talks about getting into comedy or his career at all. I found that so interesting. I kept waiting for the comedy part. He never admits it. There are just like a couple parts where he references his 20s. And I think at this point, he's you just said he's 24. And he's like, I was already touring and I was like majorly successful. And I was like hosting a TV show and I was like doing a lot of stuff around the country and the world and it was like a huge deal anyway so i went to go visit my and you're like okay i hope we get to that later we don't just spoiler alert if you ever want to find out how by 24 he was like a very successful touring comedian you won't find out especially because at 20 he was like selling stolen radios yeah i'm like what was the leap <laughs> exactly anyway so he goes and he sees his dad and they spend the day together And his dad, like, takes out a scrapbook where it turns out he's been compiling, like, every press mention of Trevor for the last couple of years. And he's been following his career and he's been so proud of him. And he's like, oh, my God, it turns out I was wanted. I felt a flood of emotions rushing through me. It was everything I could do to not start crying. It felt like this 10-year gap in my life closed right up in an instant, like only a day had passed since I'd last seen him. For years, I had so many questions. Is he thinking about me? Does he know what I'm doing? Is he proud of me? But he'd been with me the whole time. He'd always been proud of me. Circumstance had pulled us apart, but he was never not my father. He chose to have me in his life. He chose to answer my letter. I was wanted. Being chosen is the greatest gift you can give another human being. Okay. Do you guys see what I mean, though, about where the lesson he learned for Foofy maybe (laughs) is something that he's telling himself to handle any feelings of abandonment from his father? Clap if you see it. (laughs) So he goes on to talk about his experience as a mixed person in a place where being mixed was not allowed. So he explains that when Dutch colonists landed on the southern tip of Africa over 300 years ago, they encountered an indigenous people known as the Khoisan. The Khoisan are the Native Americans of South Africa, a lost tribe of Bushmen, nomadic hunter-gatherers distinct from the darker Bantu-speaking peoples who later migrated south to become the Zulu, Kosa, and Sotho tribes of modern South Africa. So when the first white colonists moved there, they had their way with Khoisan women and the first mixed people of South Africa were born. 
So then this group of people were often enslaved along with people from West Africa, Madagascar, and the East Indies. The Khoisan all but disappeared from South Africa. While most were killed off through disease, famine, and war, the rest of their bloodline was bred out of existence, mixed in with the descendants of white and slaves to form an entirely new race of people, coloreds. Colored people are a hybrid and a complete mix. Some are light and some are dark. Some have Asian features and some have white features. The history of colored people in South Africa is, in this respect, worse than the history of black people in South Africa. For all that black people have suffered, they know who they are. Colored people don't. So then he goes on to talk about being considered one of these colored people. I was the anomaly wherever we lived. In Hillbro, we lived in a white area and no one looked like me. In Soweto, we lived in a black area and nobody looked like me. In Eden Park was a colored area. Everyone looked like me, but I couldn't have been more different. It was the biggest mindfuck I've ever experienced. And he talks about just like being an insider versus an outsider when he was obviously different. People are willing to accept you if they see that you are an outsider trying to assimilate into the world. But when they see you as a fellow tribe member attempting to disavow the tribe, that's something they will never forget. That's what happened to me in Eden Park. So one of the insane things about apartheid was that you could like apply to be considered white. Every year under apartheid, some people would get promoted to white. It wasn't a myth. It was real. People could submit applications to the government. Your hair might become straight enough. Your skin might become light enough. Your accent might become polished enough and you'd be reclassified as white. All you had to do was denounce your people, denounce your history and leave your darker skin friends and family behind. You also could get demoted. Sometimes two white people could have a child who was like olive complexioned and they would be considered colored and then the family would have to break up and decide, are we all going to move to a different part of town or is the mother going to take the baby? Like, it is just so fucking insane. It's so fucking insane. There literally was like based on how the cashier at the day would eyeball you real quick and how they would categorize you. Yeah. And this system of promotions and demotions is what kept this group of people so untethered because it wasn't just this thing of like, okay, this is the life you must lead. There was a promise of something more if you just worked hard enough at it. But it was so limited. Like the chances were so slim. And then he talks about when apartheid fell, And Nelson Mandela was elected. He said it felt very much to them like the whole race had switched and the finish line was now the starting line. People were trying to be black. Black is beautiful. Black is powerful. So for centuries, colored people were told, like, be whiter, be whiter, be whiter. And all of a sudden, black people are in power. So you can imagine how weird it was for me. I was mixed but not colored, colored by complexion but not by culture. Because of that, I was seen as a colored person who didn't want to be colored. And that was not taken to very well. He was bullied constantly. He, like, never had friends. He never felt like he had anybody to play with. They would move sometimes to these white neighborhoods where nobody would invite him. And then sometimes they'd be in black neighborhoods where he also felt like he couldn't be out. And he talked about one time he was at this mulberry tree and a bunch of kids come over and start throwing mulberries at him and pelting him. And he is hurt. He's sad. It was like a scary, intense thing to happen. But he's covered in all of this juice. So his mom thinks he's just like bleeding everywhere. And she starts laughing when she realizes it's just juice. My mom thought everything was funny. There was no subject too dark or too painful for her to tackle with humor. Look on the bright side, she said. Now you really are half black and half white. It's not funny. And then he tells his stepdad who beats the ever-living shit out of these kids. And he's like, okay, well, that wasn't the right thing to do either. Revenge truly is sweet. It takes you to a dark place, but man, it satisfies the thirst. Then there was the strangest moment where it flipped. I caught a glimpse of the look of terror in the boy's face. And I realized that Abel had gone past getting revenge for me. He wasn't doing this to teach the kid a lesson. He was just beating him. He was a grown man venting his rage on a 12-year-old boy. In an instant, I went from, yes, I got my revenge to no, 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 too much, too much. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Dear God, what have I done? The little boy is left like battered to a pulp. And of course, they go back home. And then that little boy's dad comes over. And Abel, the stepfather, goes out. And I don't know what he says to him. I think he says straight up, like, don't fuck with me. I will kill you. The guy turned around quickly and got back in his car and drove her away. He thought he was coming to defend the honor of his family. He left happy to escape with his life. And that's kind of our first real taste of Abel. Anyway, so... Then he gets into matters of the heart. He was not a cute teenager. He struggled with acne. He was a bit awkward. But the thing he realized is that because he was no one, he could get along with everyone. Yeah. You know, he gets swerved by a girl on Valentine's Day. I don't think the story is like necessarily that important. But he did get her flowers and write her a poem. And then he showed up to give it to her at school and she had another boyfriend already. Yeah. Tough stuff. That's tough stuff. They, you know, did not have a lot of money. And his mom was a master of cutting corners and saving every penny possible, but in a way that was humiliating often. So they had this car that was always breaking down and she could get as much mileage out of a gallon as humanly possible. So if they were at a stoplight, she would turn the car off. If the traffic was moving slow, she would turn the car off and be like, okay, just push it so we don't have to waste gas. We're moving so slow anyway. And he was like, well, this is humiliating. But it was the way... 
We didn't have money for petrol. After school, I was on my own. Weekends, I was on my own. Ever the outsider, I created my own strange little world. He calls himself a weed dealer, but of food. And this is, again, he doesn't even say like, this is where I got my sense of humor. But he just says like, I learned how to make people laugh and feel at ease. So he would be able to like show up and people liked him there, but he wasn't part of the group. He also found a way to make money off of food because there was this food truck outside of school where you would get all your food and you just want to be first. And since he was the fastest kid, he was able to make money by being the person who was always first in line. And so the slower kids would pay him to pick up their food so that they weren't like late in line and there was nothing left. So that was kind of his first dabble at hustling as well. So he has a couple little stories from high school. And again, this is one of our stamp of approval rec books. It's a great book to read and it does read very quickly. So if you're going on a vacation, if you've got a weekend away, we really recommend it. There's a lot of stories that we're leaving out that are just like cute little stories about him growing up that are funny. And they are well constructed because he's a comedian. So he knows how to have a beginning, middle and end. There's none of this like, why did you tell us that? There's a punchline. But we're leaving a bunch out because we can't tell you everything. We can't thievery this book up. Anyway. So one of the fun stories is his friend, who's kind of a hustler in the neighborhood, is like, I could get you the most beautiful girl for prom. And he has some trade that he'll do with him. And he's like, all right, fine. Well, okay. So we later get into the fact that Trevor Noah was burning CDs and selling them. And so this was one of the guys that was like one of his CD distributors. So he was like, I want a bigger cut of my CDs and I'll get you the most beautiful prom date. Anyway, long story short, he does get her the most beautiful prom date. Everybody cannot believe how beautiful this girl is. He begs for more money just so he can buy a new outfit. He borrows his stepdad's fancy car, which then reneges, whatever. There's the whole long process of getting to this prom and you're like, what's going to go wrong? He picks her up. She's dressed beautifully. They get to prom and she won't get out of the car. Everybody's coming out begging this girl to come out of the car and come into the prom. And he's like, this is the biggest joke of all time. Trevor Noah, the nerd at school, finally got the most beautiful girl of all time to come to prom with him and she like won't get out of the car. And finally, after begging and begging and begging and people coming and trying to beg on his behalf, someone goes, you know, she doesn't speak English. And he's like, huh? And he looks back and he realizes none of the time they spent together did they ever directly communicate. It was always being translated. She met his family. He's like, oh my God, we never once had a real conversation. And as Ashley pointed out, first the deaf dog and then the girlfriend who doesn't speak English. Does he listen? (laughs) He also talks about his mom specifically instilling respect for women and respect upon him. He would come into the house and say like, hey, mom. And she'd be like, no, stop and make eye contact with me. You have to really see me when you say hello to me. And he makes a big point about the way he was taught to like respect people in this way. But then he like doesn't know that his dog can't hear him. He doesn't know that he has this girl that he asks out that like dumps him on Valentine's Day. But like they never really even knew or liked each other. I'm like, are you paying attention to anyone when you have these conversations? Like, I don't mean to equate women and dogs, but like of the few stories he does tell with these interactions, there are a number of people who he just didn't realize didn't hear him. Oh, my God. So he also starts like this DJing business because he's downloading all of this music illegally to burn it onto CDs. But then he has this huge hard drive of music and he becomes a DJ. And one of the things that you have to do when you're a DJ is it helps to have hype dancers. We've all been to bar and bat mitzvahs. You know about hype dancers. And the best dancer in his crew was named Hitler. And he explains that in Africa, you would just have like an African name and then you would have a white name. He was like, I knew people named Mussolini, like people from history. I don't know. It was just a thing. And this guy that was the best dancer in his crew was named Hitler. And so they'd all gather around and be like, go Hitler, go Hitler. And they didn't realize the implications of Hitler. For many black South Africans, the story of the war was that there was someone called Hitler and he was the reason the allies were losing the war. This Hitler was so powerful that at some point black people had to go help white people fight against him. And if the white man has to stoop to ask the black man for help fighting someone, that person must be the toughest guy of all time. So if you want your dog to be tough, you name your dog Hitler. If you want your kid to be tough, you name your kid Hitler. It just like was what it was. I met people in the West who insist that the Holocaust was the worst atrocity in human history. Without question, it was horrific, but I wonder, with African atrocities like the Congo, how horrific were they? The thing that Africans don't have that the Jewish people do have is documentation. The Nazis kept meticulous records, took pictures, made films, and that's what it comes down to. The Holocaust victims count because Hitler counted them. And this is something that really struck me. It would have struck me five weeks ago, but right now we are in the middle of witnessing a genocide, we are witnessing apartheid occur once again in the West Bank. And we are watching a genocide in Gaza and people are ignoring it completely because they say like, we can't have another Holocaust, like as we commit another genocide. 
And it is one of those things that like my entire life, it's been beaten into my head that this was this horrific atrocity and it was a horrific atrocity. I will never discount that. But the way that we ignore other atrocities, you know, it's just fucked up. Any group of people can become a victim. You have to be vigilant for all people. We have to be vigilant for all people. And to sit here and say like, we can never have another Jewish genocide. I completely agree. And in order to ensure that we have to care about all people and ensure that there is no more any genocide. This sentence really landed to be like, yes, we are taught from a young age that this was the worst thing that's ever happened. And there are a lot of really worst things that have happened. We live in a fucked up society. And it's important to educate us on all of them, not just one, because it's not about protecting one group. It's about protecting lots of groups. I didn't want to be too heavy handed in this episode to be like apartheid, wink, wink. This is what it looks like. (laughs) But something to notice. (laughs) Something to notice. I like went back to that line that was like, they bulldozed their homes to move in a new family. Pretty crazy. Wish they hadn't. Could you imagine if a group of people were kept in one small area until they needed a passport to get to the other area? Were they going to be arrested? Can you imagine if we read this book and then let it happen again? Anyway, so then the punchline of this story is that they are booked to DJ at a Jewish school. And because they like don't really understand the implications of the Holocaust or what the name Hitler means to Jewish people, he's DJing and then the dancers come out and they're like, go Hitler. And the Jewish people flip out, but he like doesn't understand what it all means. He thinks they're offended by their like sexual dancing. Yeah. He's like, oh, these white people are mad that black people are dancing sexually at them. He like doesn't realize that chanting go Hitler is like fairly offensive at a Jewish school. <laughs> So then he explains another neighborhood in South Africa called Alexandra. Alex started out as a squatter settlement where blacks gathered and lived when coming to Johannesburg to find work. What was unique about Alex is that this farmer sold plots of land to some of the black tenants but in the time when it was still legal for black people to own property. So while Sophia Town and other black ghettos were raised and rebuilt as white suburbs, Alex fought and held on and asserted to its right to exist. Wealthy white suburbs like Santon grew around it, but Alex remained. More and more squatters came putting up makeshifts, shacks, and shanties. They look like the slums in Mumbai or the favelas in Brazil. And so he talks about how this neighborhood, because it was pinned in on all sides from wealthy white neighborhoods, it never was able to flourish and expand. So it just like kept building on itself. And people just kept adding more and more shacks to the backside of those shacks, growing more dense and more compressed, leaving close to 200,000 people living in a few square kilometers. Even if you go back today, Alex hasn't changed. It can't change. It can only be what it is. So that's a little context for what he calls the cheese boys, which is the group of people he hangs out with kind of at the end of high school. As we said, we kind of skimmed it. But in high school, he works as this interim buying people food and selling bootleg CDs. And then when one of the kids who was wealthy graduated, he actually gave Trevor his CD writer so that he could kind of cut out everybody and own the full means of production. And he was able to really start making some dough. He was like, I had $50 a week, which is to this day what some like maids make as a salary. So he's like, it was a lot of money for a teenager who had no real expenses. And he goes on to say, like, this just shows that whole give a man a fish, he eats for a day, teach a man to fish, he can fish for the rest of his life. He's like, no, but you also need to give him a fish pole. It's not that he didn't have to work hard and it's not that he didn't have the smarts, but somebody had to give him the tools it took to succeed. Like he didn't have the seed money. And he's like, you really have to help people and like give them the things that they need to help themselves and not just like tell them about it. Yeah. So he's starting this business where he's burning CDs and he at some point is able to trade up for better CD writers and he's really like cranking out CDs. And then he graduates high school and he's not going to college. He's not taking a year abroad. He doesn't know what to do. So he kind of hooks up with his friend Bongani, who is a short, bald, super buff guy. He wasn't always that way. He used to be skinny, but then a bodybuilding magazine found its way into his hands and changed his life. So basically, this guy is from the town Alex that we just described. That has, he says it's like an electricity. Everything is outdoors. Everyone's running around. So much is happening. People are just running to and fro. And then all of a sudden it'll explode in violence. But then it kind of just comes back down. It is like a lot of poor people, but it is a community. And it's people who are doing the best they can, but don't have a lot. So they start hustling through Alex, where at first it's just CDs, but then they start trading other electronics. Then they would buy something off of one person, flip it for more money. They would cut deals. They would sell things on layaway. They started having so much cash that they were like loaning out money a la a loan shark and getting it back with interest. So they would sell CDs in the morning and with the cash that they had, they would go around and loan it to moms. They were so good at knowing what the value of everything is. And so he says sometimes like, you know, a mom couldn't pay back, but what she did have was a daughter that she didn't let go out. And we'd say, well, why don't you let your daughter come to a party with us? Because we know this guy who likes her. That guy would give you some beer in exchange for the right to talk to the girl. 
then other people would buy beer. It was just like a whole thing. And he's like, but at the end of the day, it was so much time for such little margins when you really look at it. Yeah, like they were flipping things into a lot more money than they were worth, but they were spending so much time like having to talk to everyone and know everything and know everyone and like everything that's going on. It started as a gap year to make money for college. And he was like, I was never making money for college. I also don't think he was ever planning on going to college. Yeah. When I look back on it, that's what hustling was. It's maximal effort put into minimal gain. The hood is also a low stress, comfortable life. All your mental energy goes into getting by so you don't have to ask yourself the big questions. The hood was strangely comforting, but comfort can be dangerous. The hood has a gravitational pull. It never leaves you behind, but it also never lets you leave. Because by making the choice to leave, you're insulting the place that raised you and made you and never turns you away. And that place fights you back. As soon as things are going well for you in the hood, it's time to go because the hood will drag you back in. It'll find a way. There will be a guy who steals a thing and puts it in your car and the cops find it. Something. You can't stay. You think you can. You'll start doing better and you'll bring your hood friends out to a nice club. And the next thing you know, somebody starts a fight and one of your friends pulls a gun and somebody's getting shot and you're left standing around going, what just happened? So he eventually has to like sort of back out of the hustle because his hard drive gets completely fried because a cop raids a party. The cop doesn't understand Windows 95. And so he's like, turn off the music. Actually, my grandpa would have loved him. He's properly shutting down all the programs as opposed to when I was little, I'd always like turn it off. Yeah. And my grandpa, oh my God, every week I would go to my grandpa's house and he would be so frustrated that I wouldn't properly shut down a computer. And I was like, it doesn't matter. I know. I always would just like push the button. So anyway, my grandpa would be so happy with Trevor Noah shutting everything down properly, but they didn't understand why it wasn't shutting off right away. And so he shot it in the monitor, try to fix things and get it shut down quicker. Would you believe that didn't fix a thing? It ended up blowing up the hard drive and it never worked again. His entire music library was wiped. So that kind of ends that. And I guess that's when he goes on to become a comedian, but we never hear another freaking word about his career. He does not get into his career at all, which I was very shocked about. I was very curious about it. I would love for him to like write another book. I guess this one does have a very specific point of like what he's trying to tell us. Yeah, he's trying to teach America about South Africa and I find it incredibly effective. Me too. But I would love to get to know him next. Maybe over dinner if you're around. <laughs> So then he gets into a story about like why his parents were so hard on him. It's because they like want you to not get yourself in trouble, but he still got himself in trouble. So his stepdad was a mechanic and at one point had his own garage, but could never keep it afloat. And so then he had to sell it because of debts. And then he was just fixing cars out of their garage for years. And so there was always extra cars and he would always just steal them. And then at one point he got pulled over and there were cars that were being fixed from customers and there were cars that they just kind of had around. And this car had no owner. It had no title. So he was pulled over with a car that had no title and he was not linked to officially in any way. And people were stealing cars all the time in South Africa. They would just like kill someone and steal their car. So now he's being held on suspicion of murdering someone and stealing a car. Like they have no reason to believe that that's not what happened here. And he doesn't realize he's like in deep shit and he refuses to call his mom because he's like, well, my mom will be meaner to me than the cops will. And it's just like, you might be charged with murder. It never sinks in how serious this is until like a cop takes him aside and is like, you are going to need to get your defense in order before you have your bail hearing because otherwise you're fucked forever. And like there's this whole thing. He ends up spending like a week in jail. He was like, it actually wasn't that bad. And he's able to use his multi-languages and like chameleon skills to not really get fucked over in jail. But finally, he gets a point where he's like, okay, actually, if this goes bad for me, it will be so bad. And he has a cousin bail him out and like pay for a lawyer. And then it turns out his mom was paying for it the whole time. He thought he had like tricked his mom into not knowing where he had been for a week. And he's going back to her house, sitting down at her kitchen table, telling her about all the fun he had that week with his cousin. And she finally says, boy, who do you think paid for your bail? Hmm? Who do you think paid your lawyer? Do you think I'm an idiot? Did you think no one would tell me? And then it turns out, of course, she knew. And she says, I know you see me as some crazy old bitch nagging at you, but you forget the reason I ride you so hard and give you so much shit is because I love you. Everything I have ever done is from a place of love. If I don't punish you, the world will punish you even worse. The world doesn't love you. If the police get you, the police don't love you. When I beat you, I'm trying to save you. When they beat you, they're trying to kill you. Which is a mixed message. (laughs) Oof. I feel her love. Me too. Interestingly enough, when she has another baby, she does not hit that kid. Yeah. It turns out she thinks hitting your kid isn't necessarily necessary. Totally. So then he finally gets into his stepfather, Abel, who pops up throughout the book, but he never really dives in on it. Abel, they liked. Like, he was a fun guy. The problem is he's an evil guy, too. And so they had been dating, and he had been, like, kind of an older brother to him. 
but he knew he had something in him that was fucked up. Abel really wanted to be liked by people. He was very helpful and the community liked him and he was nice and he was jovial. But he's like, I saw the way that he beat up that 12 year old. There is something in him that freaks me out. And the mom finally goes, hey, I want to tell you something. We're getting married instinctively without even thinking. I said, I don't think that's a good idea. I wasn't upset or anything. I just had a sense about the guy and intuition. If I had known the word sinister, then I would have used that. There's just something not right about him. I don't trust him. I don't think he's a good person. Trevor's mom and Abel get married and they have a kid pretty early. Sangha culture, I learned. So Abel was Sangha. Sangha culture, I learned, is extremely patriarchal. We're talking about a world where the woman must bow when greeted by a man. Men and women have limited social interaction. He pretty early on tries to like assert himself as the dominant man in this house. And he's like, why the fuck would you marry my mom if that's what you wanted? He's like an exotic bird collector, she said. He only wants a woman who is free because his dream is to put her in a cage. So I guess pretty early on, things were looking bad. And like they tell the story about going to visit his family and the way that he was so furious with her because she wouldn't show proper respect by waiting on him hand and foot. And Trevor's like, I liked visiting that family because in that family, men don't do anything. So I got to hang out and play video games while all my girl cousins had to clean up. Yeah. The mom did not love that. So one night, Abel and the mom get into an enormous fight. So he had an alcohol problem. Yes. He had always smoked weed. And when they got married, she was like, you have to stop smoking weed because of God. And they're like, big mistake. The weed was at least chilling him out. The alcohol revved him up. So he replaces weed with alcohol. So he would get like pissed drunk every single night. And it was like kind of the difference between is he like, so fucked up he's peeing on the sidewalk and doesn't know where he is? Or is he like so fucked up he's going to kill you? One night he comes home, tries to make himself some food, falls asleep, and they wake up to smoke and the kitchen is on fire. When they get him up, the mom is like screaming at him. You're not a man. You're a child. I can't have a child for a husband. I've got to raise my own children. Then out of nowhere, like a clap of thunder when there were no clouds, crack. He smacked her across the face. So she goes down and comes back up and yells at him again. And Trevor's like, don't do that, mom. Like, it's only going to get worse. And so he hits her again. Let's go. We're leaving. We ran out of the house and up the road. It was the dead of night, cold outside. I was wearing nothing but a t-shirt and sweatpants. They go to the police station where she says, I'm here to lay a charge. My husband hit me. And they said, ma'am, why do you want to make a case, eh? You sure you don't want to do this? Go home and talk to your husband. Do you really want your husband going to jail? And she keeps being like, yes, he hit me. He hit me. And they keep saying, is that his life will never be the same. I had never seen anything like it. I was nine years old and I still thought of the police as good guys. You get in trouble, you call the police. But I remember standing there watching my mom, flabbergasted, horrified that these cops hadn't helped her. That's when I realized the police were not who I thought they were. They were men first and police second. So they go stay with the grandparents for a little while. And then Abel comes and apologizes. And then the grandma's like, okay, give him a second chance. And she's like, no, he hit me. And she's like, well, other men will hit you, but he apologizes. With nowhere to go, she goes back. And then Abel was a mechanic. And I guess he was very skilled. And people came from him all over to use him specifically. And they decide to buy out the garage that he works at and call it Mighty Mechanics and start it together. And it turns out they did not know that when you buy a business, you buy its debt. I wouldn't have known that either. I didn't know that. So they like run the books and it is bad. They can't get out from underneath their debt. He's also not good at business. Like because of the debt, he's getting these parts for a huge markup. Everything's bought on credit. And then the other, well, he's an alcoholic. So he drinks away all the profits instead of paying off the interest. And so the debt keeps going up of his own accord as well. Then my mom sold the house that she had bought and put the money into the business as well. She went all in. She gave up everything for him. From that point on, we lived in the garage. There were times that they had so little money they were eating like worms. Yeah. So at this point, the mom has sold the house and invested in the business. They are living at the garage. Trevor sleeps in cars every night. They're like showering in the sink. They have no money for food. At one point, the mom quits her job to work for the business and run the books. But then Abel gets jealous because she is like doing a good job running the business. And people are like, oh, your wife is so good at the business. And he like feels emasculated by that comment. So she doesn't get to do it anymore. And finally, she just gets another job. She buys a new house and is like, fuck this. At this point, he brings up that she never hit his younger brother, Andrew, who was nine years younger than him and the baby she had with Abel. And he says, I grew up in a world of violence, but I myself was never violent at all. Yes, I played pranks and set fires and broke windows, but I never attacked people. I never hit anyone. I was never angry. I just didn't see myself that way. My mother had exposed me to a different world than the one she grew up in. She brought me books she never got to read. She took me to schools that she never got to go to. I immersed myself in those worlds, and I came back looking at the world a different way. I saw that not all families were violent. I saw the futility of violence, the cycle that just repeats itself the damage that's inflicted on people that they in turn inflict on others. I saw more than anything that relationships are not sustained by violence, but by love. Love is a creative act. When you love someone, you create a new world for them. My mother did that for me. And with the progress I made and the things I learned, I came back and I created a new world and a new understanding for her. After that, she never raised her hand to her children again. Unfortunately, by the time she stopped, Abel has started. 
So then he explains the first time that Abel ever beat him. And it was because he forged his mom's signature on a school document. His mom wasn't even mad about it. She's like, oh, why didn't you ask? I would have signed it. But then Abel is like, why did you do that? And he just starts beating the living daylights out of him. It was the most terrifying moment of my life. I'd never been that scared before, ever, because there was no purpose to it. That's what made it so terrifying. It wasn't discipline and nothing about it was coming from a place of love. It felt like something that would end when he wanted it to end when his rage was spent. I never trusted him again, not for a moment. So Abel and his mom end up having this like kind of on again, off again. So they got a divorce for their finances, but they did stay together. And at a certain point, they live in different rooms. I think they stay together, it seems, mostly for Andrew. Yeah, for the children. And also because she has nowhere else to go, nobody will help her. Her family keeps telling her to stay. And I guess there's this real understanding of, well, it's not better out there. But yeah. eventually she gets a promotion at her new job. She's making better money. His garage becomes like a hobby almost. He was supposed to pay for Andrew's school fees and groceries, but he started falling behind on even that. And soon my mom was paying for everything. She paid the electricity. She paid the mortgage. He literally contributed nothing. That was the turning point. When my mother started making more money and getting her independence back, that's when we saw the dragon emerge. The drinking got worse. He grew more and more violent. There was an undercurrent of terror that ran through the house, but the actual beatings themselves were not that frequent. It was sporadic enough to where you think it wouldn't happen again, but frequent enough that you never forget it was possible. He said Abel kicked the dogs too, Foofy mostly. Panther was smart enough to stay away, but dumb, lovable Foofy was forever trying to be Abel's friend. Foofy wasn't dumb. It turns out that Foofy also like didn't have a sense of feeling. So if you kicked her, she didn't feel it. So she was just deaf and numb and didn't know that she was getting kicked and that that was mean. (laughs) He says that because Abel was so well-liked in the community, he always got a second chance. The Abel who was likable and charming never went away. He had a drinking problem, but he was a nice guy. We had a family. Growing up in a home of abuse, you struggle with the notion that you can love a person you hate or hate a person you love. It's a strange feeling. You want to live in a world where someone is good or bad, where you either love them or hate them, but that's not how people are. So he's kind of under the impression that his mom is going to leave when Andrew turns 18. And then her mom lets him know that she got pregnant again. She had moved back into Abel's room. It was like one night where they made up. And she got pregnant. And he's furious. The weird thing is she had her tubes tied. Like, we don't know how she got pregnant. They thought it was crazy. She was 44 and pregnant with tied tubes. I guess they didn't tie him tight enough. But he literally is like, I was boiling with rage. All we had to do was wait for Andrew to grow up and it was going to be over. And now it was like she had re-upped the contract. And he was so mad. So he leaves home. He moves out. And she's understanding. She goes, honey, I know what you're going through. At one point, I had to disown my family to go live on my own too. I understand why you need to do the same. So he leaves and then he doesn't really spend that much time with his family until one day he gets a call. He's living with his cousin. And he's like, I'm traveling all over the world at this point. Yeah. So he just kind of skips ahead. He's quite successful, it seems. And he gets a call from Andrew. His mom has been shot. So at this point, his mom had actually left and got a new husband. That's also kind of glazed over. But one day they get home from church and Abel is waiting for them in the front yard and he shoots the mom once in her leg. It was actually her butt and once in her neck. And so he thinks his mom is dying. Like he has no idea what's going on. He's breaking down. Andrew's breaking down. Isaac is only four. So he's not really sure what's going on. It turns out Abel had like taken Isaac after the shooting and dropped him off at a friend's house and been like, take care of Isaac. I'm going to go kill myself. And he went around to all of his friends and family and were like, hey, here's what I did. I just tried to kill everybody. I killed my wife. I'm pretty sure I'm going to go kill myself. And then finally, a cousin is like, you're a coward. You're a coward. You did it. You think you're man enough to kill. You need to go be man enough to handle the consequences. So they drop him off at the police station where he admits to killing his wife or ex-wife. He shows up and says, I'm going to kill all of you. Andrew jumps in front of him is like, don't. And he goes, if you don't get out of the way, I'm going to kill you. And Andrew's like, he really will. So he gets out of the way. And then his mother jumps in front of the gun neck so that the rest of the family can run away. He shoots her in the butt. She falls to the ground. And then he's standing over her and tries to shoot her again, point blank in the head. The gun misfires. Four times the gun misfires. She's able to get up. She gets in the car. And as she's trying to drive away, he shoots her. He gets her in the back of the neck. It goes in through the back of her neck and out through her nose. Yeah. So somehow it avoids every major artery. It shatters her cheekbone and like clips a flap of her nose off. And here's the most American part. So she's in there bleeding to death. They don't know how bad it is yet. And they come out and they go, we just heard that your mom doesn't have health insurance. We're gonna have to take her to a state hospital. And they're like, state hospital? She was shot in the back of the fucking head. You can't put her in an ambulance. She's out of hospital. Do whatever it takes. 
He's like, here, take my credit card, whatever it takes. And she's like, it could get really expensive. And he's like, it's literally my mom. And she's like, it could be 3000. He's like, yeah, that's my mom. And she goes, but what if she's in the ICU? What if she's here for a while? It could maybe even be millions. You could be in debt for the rest of your life. And then he's like, really? That's a lot of money. He's like, I thought about it. He's like, you know, you think you'd do anything for your parent, but then you think millions, would that even make her happy? Who would take care of my brother? And he goes, no, okay, anything, do anything. And so then they go and it turns out it actually wasn't even that expensive. She spent four days in the hospital. Literally, the doctor goes, I don't like to say miracle, but the fact that it missed her vertebrae, missed all of her major arteries, missed her medulla oblongata, and all she had was a tiny little rip through her nose. It was in and out, perfectly clean. They still have the bullet. My mother was out of the hospital in four days. She was back at work in seven. That's insane. Crazy. And then when he's like, mom, why don't you have health insurance? She's like, I have Jesus. And he's like, but Jesus wasn't going to pay the bill. And she goes, Jesus gave me you. And you did pay the bill. (laughs) So anyway, here's the most horrific fucking part of the whole book. This is like an addendum at the end. That's where it ends. She looks at him and starts laughing and says, the good news is now you're the most beautiful one in the family. Hilarious. Love that. (laughs) I'm laughing. I'm not (laughs) traumatized at all. So they later find out what happened. And basically, there was that little baby, Isaac, the third son. I guess because Andrew got in the car with his mom and they drove to the hospital together, Isaac has just been left. And they were like, fuck, where's that little one? Isaac's four at this point. Abel had grabbed him and taken him to the cousin as we learned. And I guess in the car, the little kid goes, dad, why'd you kill mom? Because I'm very unhappy because I'm very sad. Yeah, but you shouldn't kill mom. So he drops him off. He turns himself in because he had no priors for domestic violence. Because every time she tried to file, the police said no. She actually went to the police to try to file against him more than once. Yeah, multiple times. They always said, go home. That's our friend. You can work it out. What did you do? So because he has no priors and because he was like apologetic, he gets three years probation. And the kicker is because they said, well, we can't send him to jail. He has three kids he has to look after. Meanwhile, he had never paid a dollar for them. The case never even went to trial. Abel pled guilty to attempted murder. He was given three years probation. He didn't serve a single day in prison. He kept joint custody of his sons. He's walking around Johannesburg today, completely free. The last I heard, he still lives somewhere around Highland North, not too far from my mom. What the fuck? Can you fucking believe that? And that's where the book ends. I mean, this book was so interesting. So well done. I would love like more on Trevor. I think he will write a second book. Me too. And now that he's left The Daily Show, I bet he has time. We should reach out to him. Yeah, we should see if he needs any of our contacts at publishing. (laughs) Okay, final thoughts? Love him. Love the guy. Great book. How fertile was the soil? I would say four and a half out of five. I'd give it five out of five. I guess it is like a fertile story. But again, I feel like there is like so much of him that is like yet to be tilled. I feel that he gave me enough that I don't need him. I got a lot else. Okay. And then would you like to have a drink with him? Yeah, five out of five. Get me (laughs) fucking sloppy. I would not like to have a drink with him, but I'd like to walk by the big window where I see him and Ashley chatting at the bar and go, oh boy, Uh (laughs) uh-oh. And Ashley, yeah, who else would you like to get a drink with? I would love to cheers with some of our five-star wormies, you sweet, gorgeous gorgons. 